It all began about six months earlier at the UK premiere where we'd built a solar powered cinema in London's Leicester Square and we'd linked that by satellite to more than 60 cinemas all around the country, thereby setting a new Guinness World Record. And uh, we also got the box office number one. Um, but at that event, one of the satellite technicians uh, said to me, uh, you know, it would be just as easy to link the satellite to cinemas all around the world, globally. And so from that moment on, we were obsessed with doing a global premiere. The dream was to persuade hundreds of cinemas all across the world to screen, not only screen our film, um, but also a big live event packed full of celebrities and politicians and, and, and also with live music. It was going to be the biggest live film event the world had ever seen. At this stage, we weren't really thinking through the problems of, you know, time zones or how we were going to translate the live event into all the different languages. The basic problem, there was no grown-ups involved. We just saw that we had an opportunity to use our film to bring people together all across the world and hopefully galvanise them into action, you know, in the crucial last few months when we could still avert the worst of the climate catastrophe. And from that point of view, there was, of course, only one country to be the centre of operations. America. Welcome to Team Stupid HQ in New York. And no, we haven't gone into daytime TV production, as the sign may indicate, the Martha Stewart sign, but we're being housed in the Martha Stewart Studios. So I'm not quite sure how we ended up with a wicked, massive office in Chelsea for free. Um, but when I called up this company, they call All Mobile Video, the president of the company, I just happened to speak to him and he loves our project. He said it's like nothing else he's ever seen. He's always kind of going, what are you doing? And how are you doing it? And who are all those people in your office working for free? We recruited on Facebook and Twitter. Within 24 hours, I think, of our first ad, we had five really great people working for us. I'm Julia, and I'm the NGO coordinator, global NGO coordinator. I am the runner around the town, kind of like the gopher. I'm stalking every American I can find to try to fill out 440 seats. And I am trying to get the word out to all of my friends and family. What's wrong with you? Bitch, come see my movie. This awesome. film needs you. Will people in the future call our time the age of stupid? Events like ours, trying to get publicity, really live or die on how many celebrities come to them. We were really lucky that from early on we had Kofi Annan agreed to speak, uh, we had Tom York who was definitely going to play, and we knew Gillian Anderson could come. Experts for a live one-night event, September 21st, in select movie theatres nationwide. We picked the 21st of September because it was the day before the UN General Assembly and they were doing a special day on climate change and all the world's media, all the politicians, all the activists, everybody uh, was coming together in New York to uh, talk about climate change. I am texting the UK's climate change minister, Ed Miliband, because he's just um, told us that the prime minister has told him that he's got to um, deputise for him and go to this really posh dinner and he can't now come to our premiere, which is a disaster, because I've written him into the script and he's got a really great role. So I'm texting him, trying to persuade him to dump the important dinner full of presidents and world leaders and come to our premiere instead. Shit. Frankly, we couldn't not have Ed Miliband at our event because he was the most senior politician, somebody was actually going to Copenhagen representing, you know, a major country that we'd persuaded to attend. You know, funnily enough, we weren't hearing, you know, we weren't getting response from Obama or the Chinese president. We could, we could like, um, say that, OK, you know, if you bring Obama, he can sit next to Gillian Anderson. Sarkozy, he can have... He can have Shalom Harlo, the new supermodel that's coming. Putin. Moby. <laughs> So we basically hatched this plan with Ed's team uh, that he would excuse himself from the dinner, step outside and speak to us via a satellite truck. The next problem was that because of the UN Climate Week, there was no satellite trucks left in New York. They were all booked. So one had to drive from Boston. Don't think about the emissions. Um, and then uh, the next problem was that we found out there was a huge security cordon around the world leaders' dinner. So Ed was then going to have to excuse himself from the dinner, run five blocks... <laughs> speak to us via the satellite truck uh, and then run back five blocks and, you know, go back for dessert or whatever. <laughs> On the day of the premiere itself, I started to realise how out of control this whole event had got. I mean, it was kind of ludicrous when there's like 14, 15 men putting up a huge tent in downtown Manhattan. We didn't just want to make the biggest live film event ever seen, we also wanted to make the most eco. Instead of making tapes or making prints and them all being sent to all the cinemas all around the world, you just hire a big satellite truck 
uh, and they send out the beam, whatever it is, and the cinemas all around the world capture that beam somehow. And so you save all the emissions. Um, plus, of course, instead of everybody coming to one central event, everybody just goes to their local cinemas. And so again, much, much less emissions. At the UK premiere, we powered the whole thing by solar energy. We hadn't been plugged into the mains at all. Um, and we had wanted to do the same thing for the US one. But then uh, a couple of weeks before the event, it became clear that basically doing that would cause more emissions because the only uh, solar power setup thing that we could find was so far away on the other side of the country that it would have to drive all the way to New York and that would cause more emissions. So we very sadly had to give up the idea of it being solar powered. Um, but then somebody had the clever idea of using all biodiesel. Now, before you say, not biodiesel from rainforests, chopped down rainforest, but biodiesel from waste, from New York waste, I believe as well. Air conditioning is usually a huge uh, part of the emissions of an event like this. Uh, so it was going to be zero air conditioning. So instead we got a gang of volunteers, including Julian Anderson, uh, to come to the office and make paper fans for our guests. All the food and drink was of course uh, organic and local. In fact, some of it was very, very local because we had some edible decor grown in Brooklyn for our guests to graze on. The green carpet was all made from recycled soda bottles. We had a beautiful display of exactly the number of bottles that America uses, plastic bottles, every second. Mark in the track, this is Lizzie. Murphy's going to be ready to play or play in five, ten minutes. Show business, right there, you see that? Fucking show business. And then there was Moby's sound system, which was all powered by uh, pedal power. I was just wondering why you have gotten involved in the Age of Stupid campaign. Uh, well, climate change in general. I mean, there are a lot of other issues that I'm involved in, whether it's human rights or animal rights or environmental issues, and, and I work with a lot of different political organizations. But for me, all of those sort of fall by the wayside if you have a billion climate change refugees. You know, and if suddenly the price of food is a hundred times what it is now. So before we can deal with any other issue, we sort of have to take care of the fact that a billion people on the planet might be dislocated because of climate change. Everyone else who did come to the New York event had to come by, of course, low carbon transport. So bikes, bike rickshaws, electric cars, uh, boats, rowing boats, sailing boats, uh, rollerblades, skateboards. We had them all. Now, flying is, of course, the big one when it comes to emissions. So um, we only four crew members uh, flew from London. Everybody else was local New Yorkers and none of our celebrity guests were allowed to fly in. Um, we only invited people who we knew were already going to be in New York. And in Copenhagen, it's uh, a little more than 50% of all the inhabitants who ride a bike every day to their work. So I think that's very good for the climate. We couldn't afford proper branding boards, so we had volunteers physically holding posters behind the celebrities as they talked to the world's media. It points to every aspect of, of the situation that we're in right now and the impact that we've had across the globe in such a, a poignant and um, heartbreaking way. It, it really shook me up afterwards. I, I had a hard time um, responding to questions that were being asked. And it moves you to action in a way that, that I haven't been moved to action before. For the UK premiere, we had a team of eco-auditors and they worked out that we produced 1%, only 1% of the emissions of a similar premiere. Uh, for the global premiere, unfortunately, we just frankly didn't have the cash to uh, have a similar team of eco-auditors. But I reckon we used about 10%, and that was because of the four flights that we took from London. But it's still not bad. We have leaders of some of the most prominent uh, non-profit organisations okay. around the world. Right now, people should be putting pressures on their government to go to Copenhagen to work for a fair, ambitious and binding climate treaty that actually yeah. 
sets us in a path of a green economy that is sustainable and that reverses the catastrophic effects of climate change.